Okay, this tape is part of the Middle Tennessee Oral History Collection, designated as MT 2007-347. I'm Elizabeth Pease. Today is October 26, 2007, and I am interviewing Mr. Joseph T. Smith um, in Murfreesboro, Tennessee, for my history class 3010 at MTSU. Also present with me is our graduate teaching assistant, Megan Otter. Mr. Smith. Thank you for doing this for us. I do appreciate Pleasure. it. Thank you, <clears throat> I am going to ask you some, some sort of general initial questions, but just to get you thinking about what I'd like you to focus on is uh, I'm personally very interested in, in the whole life of veterans at MTSU during the period of time that you were there, specifically the 1950s. And so that's kind of the mindset that I'd like you to be thinking of, if you don't mind. Um, but first, um, I need to get your full name and where you were born. Uh, Joseph T. Smith. I was born in Tullahoma, Tennessee, January the 9th, 1928. Okay, and where did you grow up? In Tullahoma. Uh -huh. and what was it like growing up there? Um, I didn't know any difference. You know, it's sort of an isolated town, and transportation wasn't the easiest thing in the world, and we didn't have a car, so it was pretty localized until somewhere around 14 or 15 I managed to to get a car and could go out and date girls in Manchester and Shepherdville but um, it was a nice town it was a busy town um, Camp Forest was opened uh, in, in preparation for World War II and I was working in a drugstore at the time so um, uh, I did have exposure to a lot of guys from um, up north, particularly Chicago and Illinois, mm -hmm. and they had, had more trainees out there at the time. And it was a bustling sort of wartime town, um, but basically the school system remained pretty much the same. And I was, uh, I look back, and I had some very good teachers. Mm -hmm. I wish I had taken advantage of them a little more, but um, they were. It was a good faculty and a good school system, and still is a good system. That's what I hear. What was it like being um, exposed to those Northerners coming down to Camp Forest for a Southern boy? Well, they just made fun of the way we talked, and uh, but I had several friends that they would have uh, they would get off on on friday sometimes and they'd come into the drugstore that's we didn't have too many things for their entertainment so uh, of course some of them hit the beer joints but they had an awfully lot it was a busy drugstore and uh, so i didn't come in frequently i got to know, know some of them and did them some favors when they shipped out i'd box up some of their belongings and send back home and uh, so uh, and, and of course the only thing that basically saved Tullahoma is when they moved uh, the AEDC facility there and so it's and what still, does the AEDC stand for? Uh, Arnold Engineering Development Center and uh, so it, it's still uh, really one of the mainstays in Tullahoma. Okay so Camp Forest was sort of an Army Air Corps base? Well, no, it was just an army base. Now, they did build a, a, a bomber a base there in Tullahoma, in which they were training, training bomber pilots. Okay. Well, tell me how, um, tell me what your wife's name is. Big boy. Your wife? My wife? Yes, your wife. <laughs> your wife and maybe how you met her. Oh. Um, I switched subjects on you, I'm after sorry. After a stint in the Marine Corps, um, I came to Middle Tennessee State University and um, on the GI Bill and uh, roomed for a while in room 200 of Jones Hall, which the hall is still standing. <laughs> I don't know how it's, you know, survived at least two, room 200. There were four hours in it. It was built for two people. And, uh, but uh, I met Billy. I think she was singing in the choir and I was a music major and um, and was singing in the choir even though I was a, an instrumental major and Neil and Margaret Wright were in charge of the music department and uh, 
they were just very infectious sort of people and um, invited me to sing and I said you know I've never tried this so we'll come in and try <laughs> so um, anyway that's that's where I met Billy and she was hanging out in the music department quite often she was in some drama and English and, and it was, I think she was a, maybe a chemistry major but uh, I didn't realize that so much until we were married and um, didn't go well at all uh, I, I was set up by uh, one of her friends and later my friend the guy and told me now she's kind of smart addict said you're going to have to be careful with it but and so I was just really smart uh, I, I did everything she opened her mouth and said something wrong I was just right on her case and uh, next day she told people in the, the hangout that all about me and how she would never and would not recommend that anyone ever go out with Joe Smith. So we got back together and three months later we were married. Yeah. So it's it's only lasted now about fifty nine years. Wow. So you know, don't ever get haste, you know, get in haste, get married. It just doesn't work. <laughs> I guess not. No, well. Um no, it's we've been very blessed. And uh but it is sort of odd that how things turned around. And so we lived, and you're talking about that village. Um, <clears throat> there, was, <clears throat> there was a uh, three-level echelon there for housing. There were small trailers. They moved in a lot of the old trailers from the pre-camps, like in Tullahoma, Tennessee, 10 years. They bring at least 10, 15 years old trailers, you know, and put them on the campus there. But they were small ones, which we inherited. One of the smallest ones, and then there were the larger for you know the people that had been there a year or so. They'd moved up into this, and then the palatial apartments were the barracks that they had moved or had built there on campus when they had military here during World War Two. And um, so we lived there and was happy in in, in the uh, the little trailer. And it was right back of the uh, science building, the old science building. And uh, there were about three or four veterans and Billy would slip in the windows in the lab and go over and do lab work. Um, and uh, so that was a nightly venture. And then uh, we, we moved from there over to um, an apartment on Tennessee Boulevard, right across from where the tennis courts are now. And uh, we remained there until um, well, she, she was a graduate before I, and uh, she was about two years ahead of me in, in school. And when I graduated, I took a job in Winchester. And uh, of course, it moved at that time. So um, as, as far as the, the Veterans Affairs, they pretty well ran the campus and um, so there were it probably they were then there were more veterans on the campus than there were uh, normal uh, college youngsters and so about that was they didn't just bully themselves into it they were just mature and they were outnumbered and elections would go to some military person. Huh. Um, I want to go back just a second, though. I, I want to get into this, but I want to go back just a, just a second and ask you um, um, about your time. You were in the Marine Corps, right? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> During World War II. So can I ask you just well, where you spent most of your time? Well, actually, it was right after the war. Okay. And uh, I, I was never into combat. Um, but I was stationed at, um, of course, went through Paris Island in South Carolina and transferred to Lejeune, the Marine Barracks at Lejeune in North Carolina. And uh, I did head up a 2,200 men, um, small force that we were called on to uh, go to the Mediterranean. There, there was political problems, communist problem, basically in Athens, Greece. And um, by all fickle finger of fate, uh, 
at 19 years old, I was promoted to, to a buck sergeant, which was required a minimum to get a sergeant major's military spec number and was appointed sergeant major of this and thank god we didn't run into a problem because i hadn't been in the corps over a year and here i was a sergeant major over 2200 men and i think i probably was the youngest person in the entire outfit but we were transported to um um, um just north of lejeune moorhead north carolina and boarded uh, a troop ship um, which took us to the Mediterranean and there our forces transferred the USS Midway, an aircraft carrier, um, and we cruised the Mediterranean for about six months, six to eight months, um, not knowing from day to day whether we were going to have to make a beachhead landing in Greece, but thank God we didn't. <laughs> I didn't need that experience. I mean, a dummy, you know, in charge of 2,200 people. Because mm -hmm. uh, none of us, well, I say none, there were a few that had had experience in, in, in uh, close combat and so forth in the Philippines. And also right on through the islands there. And But half of those were just wacky from the, the service. And they were just existing. But. Uh, great men but they were really warped um, and uh, but that's basically the, the limit of my, <coughs> my service <coughs> and nothing real exciting about it well, yeah. what was it like to come back to to middle tennessee after having been abroad for the first time and coming back to middle tennessee and well actually i was ex extremely lost um there was nothing really going on in Tullahoma, and I had thought about signing over to the Corps before I decided, well, I'll go ahead and take my discharge, and then if I decide that I, I want to come back, I can always do that, you know, if things don't go well. And <clears throat> so, <clears throat> um, like I say, we, we didn't have money, <clears throat> certainly, and, but then we didn't have money. Um, but it was a Sunday afternoon. <coughs> Pardon me. <coughs> Can I get you some water? No, that's okay. I, I was um, uh, downtown and nothing happening. And I walked out of the Delahoma drugstore. That's where I had worked in high school. And uh, there was a, a neighborhood friend who had, had been in the Army and I hadn't seen him in about six years. I uh, drove up and his name is Jack Allen and he says Joe he said when'd you get out and I told him we started yakking he said well what are you going to do and I said Jack I don't know I'm lost uh, I may go back to the Corps he said no he said you go to college <laughs> but it just it changed my life um, he said well let's go get your, get your gear and I said, well, it's not much, Jack. So we drove to the house and I packed a bag and all that was dungarees and military thing. I didn't have any civilian clothes at the time. And um, so we um, came to Middle Tennessee State and I said, where, where are we going to stay? He said, don't worry about a thing. I'll take care of it. He was one of those go-getters, you know. And so walked in and there were two other guys from Tullahoma. One was Doyle Kaiser. He was a pre-med person. And um, he, he was a freshman there, I think, that at that time. And um, Fred Ryder, who was a Navy veteran, and Jack, who was an Army veteran, um, and this Marine. They were four people in room 200. I said, well, we won't be here this much anyway. He said, just a place to hang your clothes. And it was. We, we had a pretty good time. Uh, everybody going their own way but it was really interesting he said that was on the Sunday afternoon he said nine in the morning go over to the business office and see Dean Beasley and uh, uh, you, you'll have to register for school and pay you I said Jack I don't have any money I didn't have about 15 20 dollars if that much 
And so I went over and, and, uh, and went up to the window and I asked for Dean Beasley. And he said, I'm, I'm Dean Beasley. He said, what can I do for you? He said, you're a veteran. You want to rest you, don't you? I said, yeah, but I don't have any money. He said, don't worry about it. Just fill out these forms and I'll take care of you. And it was the darndest way to do business I'd, I'd ever seen. And just everybody was just, you know, open arms. Uh, and it didn't take me long to feel at home here at Middle Tennessee State. And so you went to school, I guess, I guess with open arms like that. You went to school on the GI Bill, you yes. said earlier? Mm -hmm. So yeah. what exactly did that entail? What did you get? From the GI well, it paid uh, all of the schooling, and as a veteran, I was paid so much a month, and I can't tell you really how much it was. Maybe, maybe fifty dollars a month since I was going to school, going to be producing, you know, money later on. So they treated veterans really quite well, and would would do everything in the world to, uh, you know, help them get through school and uh, I was for a while there well actually for about three or four years uh, I was a drummer as I didn't major as a, as a drummer but in high school I had been a drummer with a dance band mm -hmm. and so I managed to hook up with a, uh, a McFarlane <laughs> uh, fellow here that a band and he needed a drummer and uh, so I made ten dollars a night playing in clubs and that, that got me through. And that supplemented your income? Yeah. And that's how you supplemented your income when you were first married too? Yeah. In fact, I played, when I went out into high school, I still played club jobs, not at ten dollars a night, but a little better than that. And uh, yeah, I guess I played about six years, but when I came to university, I had already pulled away a little bit from that. Um, so it's a little more stable financially, and it wasn't all that exciting anymore. And uh, so I decided when you came here and took this job that I was going to spend all the time on the job because it was in pretty bad shape. Mm -hmm. It had been through two or three band directors that had just wrecked the department. It worked out real well and uh, didn't do too much damage. And I want to talk about the band, but I also want to, I, and I know I'm meandering a little bit, well, but I okay. want to take you back to, um, you, you were talking about the veterans' villages, and, and in an interview that I saw with you earlier, um, you mentioned that there were a lot of, there was a lot of camaraderie between the veterans and the veteran students and the veteran teachers. Can you give me some examples of what life was like for the veterans? I mean, I know you said they ran the school, but can you tell me a little bit about the veterans' village and what went on there and how you all ran oh, the school? Well, um, you know, living in the lower income bracket of the veterans, um, we didn't have, we had electricity um, to the trailer. But we didn't have bathing facilities, so there was a, a big uh, a building with half a dozen showers for men and half a dozen for women, something like that. And so you get up in the morning, you'd go to the wash house, you know, and clean up and shave and maybe sometimes freeze to death <laughs> or not burn up either way. So it was, that was the central place where a lot of the things, you know, kind of took place of the camaraderie. And, um, Believe it or not, most of the veterans were, were very conscientious about getting an education too. I mean, we had some fun, but we didn't skip too many classes. Um, <clears throat> very conscientious about it, and um, most of them made you know good grades and made were good students. They were, ended up present the student body and in leadership positions in uh, in the school. Um, I don't know much else that I can tell you, but everyone was looking forward to getting maybe into the the, bar uh, the the buildings that were moved in that had bathing facilities, you know. And not air conditioning, mind you, but at least uh, alleviated having to walk to the... Did you have air conditioning back then? Um, 
Oh yeah, yeah, we had air conditioning. I, uh, I was just just thinking that uh, we didn't have enough money to buy one when we rented an apartment, but it, it, we didn't miss it. But there there were air conditioners. And, did you have some some favorite professors who were also veterans that you spent time with and talked to? I think about half the faculty were veterans. Um, did you have a favorite that um, you have very fond memories of? Yeah, of course the first ones were in music. Uh, Neil and Margaret Wright. Neil was in the Navy about four years during World War II and Margaret was a gangbuster. That's all of it. She's just a live wire. Uh, they, uh, of course, he went to service, and she went into the Red Cross and served into the in the Indian Ocean region. Um, and she was an entertainer. Um, she was a singer. She was a pianist, and I'm sure she was successful there. And um, but. They're the ones that really opened their arms to me and all the veterans. Um, and the music department was very prosperous. They built a tremendous choir, a great band, um, started string programs. And uh, so, now in, in the history, there was a guy by the name of Pop Evans um, that. He was just bald-headed. I never will forget this. And I had a history class with him and a lot of veterans in there. And we, had, we were always pulling stunts. And this one veteran, was, <clears throat> which is just a guy who came in, he happened to be a veteran, you were asking about. And he runs Pop's head and he says, you know, he said, that's as smooth as my wife's bottom. And the Pop went up and says, it is, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> It just, it was one of the funniest <laughs> things I've ever seen. It seemed to transpire and be that witness, you know. I mean, it was just, it was just wide open. He says, it's smooth as my black spot. And, you know, it is, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> so that's, that's about the funniest thing that I recall that, that occurred with, with veterans in, in a classroom. And, uh, um, so... You decided to be a music major. I mean, how did you decide to be a music major? Because of Margaret and Neil. That was really the reason? You had been yeah. a drummer in the in high school? Yeah. But uh, I, I didn't... After I got to school, that was not <clears throat> my reason for being there. Because in high school, I was sort of a nut in physics. Uh, it was going into that air math and, and physics. Uh, but, you know, you just, thank goodness I, I did, because I, I've enjoyed uh, my high school career, and uh, and certainly the university has been very kind over the years. So, um, Did you have any special stories about Mr. and Mrs. Wright? I know you said that they were a huge influence on you. Was there any particular thing that stands out in your mind about them? Nothing <clears throat> other than just being really decent human beings, and Margaret was <clears throat> just a fantastic gang, just gangbuster. She had a, a degree in um, physics and something else from Vanderbilt, and at the same time she was going to Vanderbilt, she got a degree in music. She was a phenomenal organist, pianist, singer, you name it, she could do it. And evidently she was good at entertaining troops. Uh, it's one of the things that she did with the Red Cross there. In the so area. did the USO not exist yet that you know of? Or Beg your pardon? The USO, was that part of the Red Cross at that time? No, don't think so. I believe that was a completely separate outfit. And, and, uh, I, I don't recollect any of the interplay between those, those, those two organizations. And Neil, um, he was a marvelous singer. His mom was a professional singer. He grew up singing. And there used to be a show called Sunday Down South that was on WSM every Sunday afternoon. 
And when he was 14 years old, he was playing trumpet with that band. So he was, both of them were just unbelievable musicians. Uh, and, uh, and hard workers. Margaret was a lot harder worker than Neil. Neil was kind of laid back, but he got the job done. Mm -hmm. And Margaret was just a go-go girl all the time. Mm -hmm. uh, she had a group called the Sacred Harp Singers that um, most people never heard of, but they, they've heard of them. So, but they use shape notes, which I had never heard of shape notes, but it goes back to maybe in the 15, 16, 1700s, certainly in the 1800s, where these vocal groups used the shape notes. And I can't explain to you what they are, but Margaret knew how to teach it. And they, she got a lot of notoriety because she sang, a group sang at a lot of conventions locally and nationally. So uh, they were good ambassadors for the Middle Tennessee State, that music program. Sounds like they had a real influence on you. Oh, yeah. And, uh, oh, there's Neil. <laughs> I don't have a picture of Margaret. But, uh, you changed my life, and uh, I, was, I was a pretty rotten kid, I guess, uh, so I, I needed some straightening out. I can't imagine you were a <laughs> rotten kid. <laughs> well, the Corps did a lot to straighten it out, but you know, Neil was a phenomenal example, and uh, there were two of us, both of us veterans. Neil had a little office in the corner of a classroom and so he had a good looking secretary but now there would never been anything going on there at all but we say uh, we, we we knew when the secretary was coming so we watched when she went to work it was between classes she was part-time uh, secretary and full-time student and uh, so They'd been there about 15 or 20 minutes, and, and George, his name was George Cooner, he was a veteran Navy guy, he was always into something. He, um, he had one of these punch-like things to lock the door, so he had been in there and came out and he just punched that thing, so it locked the door with the secretary. So we let about 10 or 15 minutes go by and we went over and turned the knob and it was locked. Oh, George started beating on that door. <laughs> and beating on it, and Neil finally came to the door and opened it. George said, what's going on in here? What's this door being locked in? you do doing lock in it with this student. <laughs> <laughs> it's the first time I have ever really, I was part of the thing too, but uh, George was the leader in that, and he could have shot us. He just <laughs> embarrassed him to no end. And, but anyway, that's about the funniest thing, the funniest prank we ever so Mr. Neal wasn't happy with you that day, huh? Oh, well, he got over it. He got over it. But, um, um, I don't, if you just ask me, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you what I know, but as far as, you know, really having a lot of knowledge about what was going on, um, See, I came back here in 57, so that, there's still quite a few veterans um, coming back from the little skirmishes that we had had, you know, over in the, in the Pacific and, and other places. So, um, um, what was it like being um, being somebody who essentially was, you were 19 or 20 when you came back? Mm -hmm. What was it like being an adult around kids who had never had any any kind of uh, experiences, never seen anything like the war or any, even what you saw in Greece? What was that like to, what was it like to deal with the kids around MTSU? Because they were kids. Or did you yeah. come into contact with them much? Um, well, being in the band, um, there's a camaraderie there, and it, it, it doesn't matter whether you were in the military or not. I mean, 
you have you have to play your horn well and in the case of the marching band you know you'd have to get out there and sweat a little bit and uh, which was old hat to veterans but to young people we did have young people learn to march I, I do recall that and because and, and Neil was in the Navy and Navy don't they don't have no. <laughs> <laughs> they don't march, that's true. Um, they stumbled in formation. Yeah. You can't, but you no. were a Marine. So. Yeah, and, and, and so um, I don't think there was the veterans still. Now, as I was saying, um, the veterans still felt more comfortable with that group. But when you get into an organization, I think all of us had enough sense, you know, that it's an organization now we must fit in, you know, we must follow whatever, and, and in this case, be leaders, because they were young people, and they hadn't marched, and they had, some of them played real well, and some of them needed a little coaxing, and we'd have section rehearsals, and usually a veteran would be in charge of the section rehearsal. So I, I, I don't know of any problem we ever had with, um, you know, with, with younger people. Mm -hmm. um, I, know, I know I didn't, and, and he had, he built, he and Margaret built that band from, I think they may have inherited about 10 or 15 students. And by the time I had arrived there, about my second year, we marched 100. And when we had a hundred, that was the largest band in the state, including wow. Tennessee. Um, that was our marching one hundred. Isaac Lipton picked that up several years ago when Sammy Swore was there. And uh, but if we hit a hundred people, we put on the band. Um, so they were very successful in, in, in building the program and their vocal groups were just superb. Yeah. So, so veterans participated in college life pretty much? They participated oh, yeah, in everything? yeah, because they'd been cheated out, you know. <laughs> <laughs> they felt like it was cheap, so they had to try to do as much as they could, basically. So, so even though they had wives mm -hmm. and kids and all of that, they went to the football games and the marching bands and all that kind of stuff? Generally speaking, yeah. Uh, several of the, the veterans in the band were married, mm -hmm. and if they had children, they were very young, because uh, it was after the war that they, they got home, you know, and things that. And they were usually about those veterans' children when I was there, about two, three, or four younger. And I doubt if any of them were over, over four years old. And in fact, I remember James Williamson, a dear friend of mine. He and his wife uh, lived in. They had one child at the time, and if you had a child, you got a couple of points towards getting to those army, old army barracks, you know, with a bath and you know, all of the conveniences. So he lived there, and uh, then later, uh, James was responsible for me getting a job down in, in Georgia, uh, about 30 miles from where he was teaching. He, Heard of the school opening. It was a good school and a good principal. And uh, it was so good that it took me three weeks to ever accept the invitation to become band director here. And, uh, but secretly, I didn't think I was ready for teaching in college. And I was very happy that it was, it was Covington, Georgia, just about 28 miles outside east of Atlanta. And the people were just like I could imagine back in the 1800s. They were just marvelous individuals and wealthy planners. Um, the older folks had townhouses, which were just beautiful antebellum homes, but they owned plantations out from uh, Covington. And, uh, it wasn't burned when Sherman marched through Atlanta, burned Atlanta and burned the sea. Uh, he spent the night with his uh, roommate at, um, at uh, West Point. And so they, all of those homes survived. So
actually left there and burned <laughs> <laughs> everything to, to the ocean. Um, so if you if you like architecture, sometime you're driving east out of out of Atlanta, go to Covington and Floyd Street is nothing but one beautiful old home after another. But you ended up not taking that job. You ended up. Taking oh, I took it. I oh, stayed there two years, and I was so happy. I didn't. I didn't really want to leave. And two, I, I didn't feel as though I was really ready for a college job. But Mr. Smith, also a veteran, wanted mm -hmm. to wanted to talk you into coming back to MTSC. Yeah. yeah. Neil, Tell me about that. Finally, uh, talked me into it. And uh, no, I. But then we had two children, and uh, the last phone conversation, um, I, I agreed to, to take the job, and it was because I said, you know, I think I was making forty-two hundred and fifty dollars <laughs> at the time, and um, I said, you know, if our youngsters ever get to college, you know, they pay the way. I'm going to have to do something besides high school teaching, you know, like this. So. It was primarily um, due to the future of the youngsters that I took the job. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and it worked out well. The band wasn't... See, I had remembered a hundred-piece band. Well, I think the first rehearsal had something like 23, 24 people. And I said, well... I'm in the wrong place, but it's not because of the reasons that I was thinking that I wasn't qualified. <laughs> so but finally, I believe we got up to 35 marching, and we had some majorettes and flag girls. Uh, and Mrs. Wright, she learned how to twirl the flag, and she took the flags over. And I didn't have to worry with them. And she, of course, she can do the music and the routine and the whole bit. Um, so it started out very small, but in, in many ways that was so much better than if I had inherited a hundred piece band. Because you got to build it from scratch. I, I got to build it, yeah. And it had been a hundred piece band and then it went through turmoil? They went, they went through, um, I think about three directors, and one of them lied, said he had marching band and he had, had concert band. And, and he really had, and he had a degree in music, but he was a clarinet major. And Neil hired him <clears throat> because he, he needed a clarinet teacher, and he could do the, the band. Well, and it so happened that the band just fell apart. And so Neil kept him as a clarinet teacher and hired uh, what happened to be a very good band director from Texas, but he only spent one year, and then he went back to Texas. And so that just the band just collapsed. I mean, you take two years in graduation plus change directors, and, and you're just out. No one was recruiting, and so. Uh, and did you have to recruit for the band in those days? Oh yeah. So you've always recruited for marching bands that just wasn't made up of students who came and said, "I played." No. Flute in high no, school you, and. I don't know how many trips I made. I introduced myself to band directors, and I knew some band directors from. Uh, having gone to school here and uh, so it was um, Tuesday afternoon and Thursday afternoons I was off and I spent Tuesday and Thursday on the road and uh, I'm sorry go ahead. Well, it's just just go out and meet these directors and and when you were in college things. and you got your your degree and your master's degree you got it in music, right? What was your master's degree? What qualified you to be a band leader? Well, I didn't have a master's degree in music. Now, I participated in all the activities. But, again, I didn't have money. And when I was teaching at Winchester, I would drive in the classes, I think, uh, twice a week, maybe three times a week. And I took education courses and and what music classes I could get. In fact, we didn't offer a master's degree in music at that time, but there were cl music classes that I had not had and was not required that I would take. And I studied 
uh, clarinet with this clarinet teacher. Um, and so I, I continued that and, and, and there were some Saturday classes I was, I remember having to drive for Saturday classes. But, uh, no, I really didn't have a degree in music, but because of people I studied with and um, I don't feel like I cheated anyone. I studied with a lot of good people, and conducting and, and the clarinet, and I became very proficient in several instruments that I taught. <coughs> well, so, Mr. Wright must have had confidence in you to bring you back. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that was, he was, he didn't want anyone else. He said, well, it, we, there were actually two of us came there. Um, uh, Horace Beasley, he was teaching in Nashville, and um, uh, he accepted the job and actually had more to do with the concert band than I did. I, I had basically uh, about a third of rehearsal time, um, but he was responsible for planning for the concert band and so forth. And, and then later on, <clears throat> when I was um, I had accepted the job at the University of Georgia, and uh, it was it was in August, and I used to do an awfully lot of summer band camps and guest conducting and, and just everything in the world. So we had to make money and stuff, you know, to survive. And uh, they, uh, I, I was doing a clinic, and a department head, whom I had met briefly at one time, uh, called me and. And wanted me to come down for an interview for the Georgia job, and I said, "Look, I said, I've got, I've got six weeks, nothing but straight clinics and guest conducting, and then, and I don't know when I can get down there." And he says, "Well, you just got to come down here. That's all there is to it. We want you, and you'll be hired because I've already set it up. Just, just come down and see what we're going to offer you." Well, I did, and. Uh, so with the time I left, I said, okay, I'll take the job, but it's so late, and see, we've got to delay it for one year. I said, now, if you will agree to the appointment a year from this time, then I'll take it, but I'm not going to leave the music department. It was in August. The music department it, at MTSC? Yeah. Okay. It, it, you know, we didn't have time to get anyone in. And I was still sort of nervous about doing this, but God, if what they offered me in a salary, I don't know that I ever made it here. Uh, and uh, so when I got back, I, I asked Neil to bring Harrison in, and, and I explained exactly what was going to happen. I said, now, they've delayed the appointment for a year. And, and I said, I want you all to go ahead and start looking for someone now, and uh, because I won't be here the next year. And just to clarify, you were running the marching band at this time. Yeah. Okay. And uh, but I'd always been—I was much more of a conductor than I was marching band. And uh, I, I learned marching band in the basic Marine Corps style, <laughs> and and it was a military-oriented sort of group. And we had a lot of success, but I didn't want to do that the rest of my life. Basically, I did. But, um, I I was going to a full-time concert work, and that's what it would have been at the University of Georgia. I wouldn't have had anything to do with a football band. And uh, in the meantime, I guess it was a month after. Uh, Neil called a meeting, and, and Harris said, well, um, if you'll stay, uh, then you can have more of the, the concert band rehearsal time, and, uh, and eventually just take over the entire band program, which that's the way it happened. And uh, another thing happened, Dr. Lede, who was department head at Georgia, had a heart attack, mm -hmm. and he was out of sorts. And I said, well, we had, we had already 
talked about the changes that were going to have to be made at the University of Georgia when I came there, and it was going to be some major changes in that faculty. Um, it wouldn't have been an easy job because he was having to soft shoe around a couple of older faculty members that were not going to go well, quietly into yeah. the night. Um, so things were, it worked out better for Georgia and it worked out better for me and so I ended up taking over the entire band program, um, which was pretty much a strain. And, uh, but anyway, uh, we developed quite a program. I see. Well, let me take you back to um, the 1950s again at, at Middle Tennessee. Um, I'm really interested to know whether the veterans and you in particular ever interacted with the military, with the ROTC program. Did they ever make use of your experience? Did they ever... I'm, I'm trying to think if it... When the ROTC program started? About 1951. Oh, did it start that early? Mm -hmm. It just sort of expanded over the 1950s. It, it seemed like, um, for example, did you ever get to go see Tommy Dorsey at the ROTC dances? Yeah, yeah, we did. That's true. It was, yeah, it started about that time I came back in 57. McNair, Major McNair was the, in charge of that. And I worked with the ROTC band. Um, and they did sponsor a couple of times a year. Uh, dances and get-togethers and I worked with them with ROTC band and I worked with them on ceremonies when you have a display of various flights and so forth and um, I remember one I was telling this to someone not too long ago one of the funniest things that happened now in a core you learn procedures, you learn military tactics and so forth, and they stick with you. And I had this, oh, I had the ROTC band, and we were getting ready for their big day, um, where the brass gun band's inspection, you know, it's their inspection for the year, and it's a pass and review, the whole bit. And so I needed to have the the band inside to go over the special music that was required, you know, for this event. And there was a young captain, just race Kane. He came into the, the rehearsal and he ordered me to get that band out on the field that everybody else was out there working. And I said, the captain, we need to learn the music that we're going to be using for this. I want you on the field now. I said, okay. So he went out there and this is sort of a dirty trick, but I reverted back to some of the tricks of the core. Okay. Now, if you're in charge of a group and you ever hear anywhere near the strains of the national anthem, you stop, face the music. <laughs> if it's a flag, you salute. Okay. I said, I got it. Okay. So he was out with his battalion and so forth and he was ranting and raving and, and, and going on and so forth and I, I said man yep, Star Spangled Banner we played Star Spangled Banner and he didn't call him to attention and boy when that was over I ran over and I reamed his rear end out I mean one into the other and not in too polite a language but he understood it because it was military language and he knew that he had fouled up so that was it. We didn't ever have any problems with him anymore. <laughs> so you don't have to put that in. <laughs> but I wonder, as you can tell, <coughs> ask me some more questions about the, what we did. That was the only prank we ever pulled on. The only prank you ever pulled? On him. On him. Okay. Did you pull any other pranks on him? No, anybody? no, let's don't get into it. <laughs> let's, let's. 
okay. But what um, you won't, won't, won't be. I am also interested in, um, you know, what was a typical day like for you as an undergraduate and as a graduate? What was your typical day like at MTSC? Um, actually, it, it was very busy. Yeah, I can't talk to anything except in, in the music department. But the music department had so many activities, not only requirements for a music major, but also requirements for small ensemble, um, being in the choir, being vocal, and also instrumental. So there were rehearsals, probably two required rehearsals, or at least one a day, sometimes two. And then, when you're playing in a stage band, you have rehearsals once or twice a week. If you're in a small ensemble, such as a trumpet trio or a horn quartet, then you have those rehearsals. A music major really runs from morning to night. But some of those rehearsals are scheduled at night. And along with your, your regular classwork, uh, it was full day, and uh, but you just—that's the way it is. Is is a music major, and, it, and of course, my wife says, "Well, it was no worse than being a, a chemistry major. We we're in the lab, you know, all the time." And so I don't know how many times she would slip out of the, and go into the window with the lab, and she'd—I I never will forget unknowns. Well, I hope you find out what the unknowns are tonight, you know. <laughs> I mean, I still don't know what she's talking about, but it was, maybe you all do. Uh, no, it, it was really just a busy time. And, and you were working to supplement your income at this time as well? Uh, no, just, just dance bands and the jobs, and they, they were on Friday or Saturday night, mm -hmm. or Friday and Saturday if you were lucky. Mm -hmm. uh, I didn't do any of those during the week. So tell me what a typical weekend on campus was like, not only for you, but for the people around you, for the veterans, for everybody. What was a typical weekend on campus? Well, with good weather, there was there, there were several uh, activities. They would get a, a, a baseball or softball team up, or they, there were tennis courts over at the um, back of the old high school, which we frequented quite often. Um, I, don't know that I, <coughs> I don't know of too many. Did you have a lot of social activities? Did you go to Murfreesboro or did you go to Nashville to to go to the movies or I mean were there We had we had movies on campus. Uh, the guy would bring a screen out and uh, get back a little something, you know, drink or something to go out and sit on the grass and watch a movie. And we'll forget those. We look forward to that. And, uh, and I don't think we didn't have a, if I recall, we didn't really have a student union building. Yeah, we had the James Union building in 57, by 57 when I came back here. Um, but I don't remember too many activities. Of course, I wasn't a student at that time because I really, I really wouldn't know what was going on there. Um, we'd have hot dog cookouts, hamburgers at times, and uh, what? Well, you spent a little time in Veterans Village, so what was that like? Was social time like that? What was it like there? Social hour and. Veterans Village. What did the wives do? Well, actually, there wasn't all that much. There was a different breed. Most of those guys, um, you get out of the service and you're in school. You're you really aren't there to have a great time, uh, being married and having children and so forth. They were pretty dedicated and confined to going to classes doing their homework and taking care of the family. Um, 
I don't really remember ever having a social get together of Trailer Town. It just, I don't think it happened. And they called it Trailer Town? Well, yeah. <laughs> Often only it was Trailer Town because it, well, you had this wash house in the center and you had these trailers down on either side of it. And I, I, I had forgotten about it until it just came out. Yeah, it was Trailer Town. Did, but, you know, there must have been some social social life there because they had a, a, a mayor and they had, you know, um, they did Mr. and Mrs. Vet's Village. Did you ever, were you all ever up for Mr. and Mrs. Veterans Village? No. No? No. Did you ever go to the little grocery store there and hang out and play ping pong? Yeah, I had forgotten that. Yeah, I, I remember that, but... I didn't frequent it too often, but I do remember the ping pong tables. I don't think I ever played ping pong. Well, there. what did you and your wife do for fun? Well, um, she was from Murfreesboro. They had a farm out here on the old Manchester Highway. And she worked part time <coughs> for her brother, who was Dr. Gene Odom, in fact, uh, Doc Odom's son. Uh, you know this clinic down here across the corner from the service station mm -hmm. so that's his son that uh, is a doctor there now and uh, she worked for him and uh, we we really didn't have very active social life unless it was a dancer or a concert uh, of course we had a lot of concerts that in many cases we were required to attend music major. Uh, there wasn't a lot of social times and just they'd all hang out. There was they were up no, there's we just didn't get into that very and I don't think too many of the vets did. Mm -hmm. uh, there just wasn't time for it. No. And, and and they had a different mindset. It wasn't that they were didn't enjoy life, you know, but they were working to get the degree and get out of there, you know, get on with their life. You did say that they kind of ran the school and they did do oh, the yeah. football games. So tell me a little bit more about that. Tell me about them running Can the school. We oh. wait on that until it changed. Here we go. Well, Coach Murphy was a Navy veteran and uh, he was a, just a really a likable guy. And so mostly veterans um, formed this little pep band and um, I remember the first one I went to and we, we, it was 13 piece band it called the Thirsty 13 and we loaded into I think two cars and we drove all the way to Maryville Tennessee to support Coach Murphy in a football game um, and, of course, we were the hit of the season. <laughs> Sometimes we had dressed rather uh, garish and pull some funny stunts. Uh, but we would go on the field and uh, try to form a G or something like that. And I always had a joke, you know, that the guy would run over with a, a microphone and we'd say, Well, gee, we don't have enough for the G, but G, we is high, G. <laughs> All sorts of crazy things. And we... We went one time um, to um, Memphis to support the team, and we stayed. This time we were we spent the night in Maryville. We got in the cars and drove back. We were just that crazy nutty, and so we spent the night in the Peabody Hotel, and um, they had an art convention that weekend, and we uh, we had our own uniforms so to speak for our, this pep band and the uh, the drum major was Jack Allen and uh, I've got to tell you about Jack he was he lived about two blocks from me growing up but he was a little older never associated at that time but when he went to Germany and with the army um, he got hit with a machine gun and took him back patched him up 
two weeks later he was back on the front lines. First time out, machine gun hit him again. <laughs> okay, now, so he goes back to the hospital, a couple of weeks, they patch him up. He goes back, you know what happened. Third time in a row. Now, this guy, and he was my roommate, he looked like Swiss cheese. I mean, uh, I mean, they were not, oh, they were all healed, you know. I don't know how many bullet holes he had in him. It, of course, it never killed him. He just, <coughs> they, they didn't hit the vital deal, so it might have good doctors won. We never talked about it. But he, he really loved life. And so, on this special occasion, being in Peabody Hotel and being in Memphis, he, he was quite a dresser, and he dressed in complete tux, except for his pants. And he had on his black patent leather shoes, black socks, black garter, red and white polka dot shorts, tail coat, bib, <laughs> bow, and the rest of us had garish outfits, but he was just, this was, he overdid it. So we walked through the lobby of the Peabody Hotel, and people on the, on, 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 on the elevator coming down was already just breaking up, absolutely breaking up. And so we walked through, he never cracked a smile, he just walked right through it, oh, and he had a cane. <laughs> and this crew behind us, but I never will forget the expressions on the face of these people <laughs> seeing this guy. <laughs> <laughs> he never let on that he didn't know that he did any pants. So we had quite a halftime show uh, at, at University of Memphis that, that Saturday night, I guess it was. Mm -hmm. uh, that's some of the funnier things at the vet. That's what our people. And, uh, Since they were a more serious crowd, um, can you tell me what kinds of things you all as veterans were thinking about in in the 1950s? I mean, were you thinking about um, the world at large? Were you thinking about, you know, communism or Sputnik or civil unrest? Um, did you pay attention to um, the blacks on campus? Were there black veterans on campus? I know I'm asking you a lot, but just to give you a little food for thought. I really don't remember blacks at that time on campus. Even as caretakers? and I just don't remember a black at that time. Now I'm not saying that we're not. Um, the, the first black I had in the band here was I don't know what year, but his dad was a principal here. I think his name meant um, he's a tremendous young fellow. And thank God he was the first one because everybody in the band loved him. Uh, we, we had no problems whatsoever. Uh, George is his first name, and I think his last name. And he's a teacher down in, in Nashville right now in Metro. Um, still plays string bass. And uh, I, I see him maybe once every two years. And, uh, but I can't think of the, yes, I can think of the second black. His name was Eric Starks from Chattanooga. And the following year, his, his uh, sister came to school, but she was not an instrument. I think she was a vocal major. So that's, that's really all I can remember of the, of the, the black students, and it, it was never a problem. We, we, with George, he was such a, a great guy, and and the band members, I don't know, they, they might be a little different because George was a good musician, and he was, he's a clean-cut kid, and just and he didn't know that he wasn't white, you know, and there's never any indication whatsoever. Um, and we've had all the blacks that we've had. I've, 
They just come in, they play. If they if they can't play, I mean, I, I dress them down, you know, but it's not, you know, because you're a green, yellow, or white. You just don't, you better learn to play your part, boy. Yeah. <laughs> so, um... Well, what about the, the world at large? What were you all thinking about in the 19... In the 1950s, I mean, what what kinds of things were, what kinds of political things were you thinking about on campus, or did you, did you pay attention to the politics of the age at all? Well, I'm sure the the, the vets that were in political science and or actually academia. Um, were but I don't think in the music department a music major has an awfully lot of time requirements and a lot of performances um, I don't know that of any any time that I had conversations in with musicians about what's happening in the world now I did have quite a few political science, well, more history classes than political science. <laughs> and there might be a mention of something. I, no, I, I would say they were not concerned with it. Okay. Well, let's switch tack a little bit. Um, why don't you tell me about um, how you came up with the idea for the Veterans Salute? Tell me about that whole, that whole process, that whole idea. I think it was... Um, why don't you tell us what the veteran salute is first? <clears throat> um, well, I, I don't know that, that I was the one that did that. Uh, ROTC and Major McNary, I, I did have a lot of... Oh, workings with the ROTC since I agreed to take their band over. Um, but it, I think it just simply started out as um, parade fundamentals for the cadre and I think I don't know whether it was my idea or not. It very well could have been. I will um, tell you in an interview that you did earlier, it, it came out that it was indeed your idea. Um, I don't know. I, I, I guess I just simply felt that that a vet, veteran should be recognized. And, 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 You know, it's one thing, you get home and there's a parade, blah, 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 well, that's the end of it. And, and so many of the people that I had been associated with, you know, during my time at the college when I came back, and also after I came back to teach, um, I think there was enough um, interest among several of us that, that there should be more recognition. I mean, a continuing recognition for what those guys and gals went through. And uh, boy, I hadn't thought of this in God knows when. Um, but the ROTC had an awfully lot to do with this, and um, of course they would naturally. And I had some problems. Joe, I'm going after Cindy and I, I mean Casey and I went to pick up some coffee. Okay, huh? Um Yeah, it was a cooperative thing between the band and ROTC because they were going to feed the vets. And they were going to do the, send out the invitations and work with veterans of foreign wars and American Legion. That was all they were doing. They're trying to get the vets there. I was going to do the performance end of it. Um, and they, uh, 
the biggest problem I had was the captain again wanted to use a howitzer on the field and I just said absolutely not there's no way there's no way and but the major went along with the captain and he said you just take care of your part you let us do what we're going to do and he blinded a girl on me after I went to him I said look let's let's put that cannon somewhere else he was facing the track and, and the, let's see for him yeah that corner of the field and um they didn't oh no we're going to go through the ritual you know the loading you know and this and this and this and ramrod and all that sure enough they did and sure enough it's the first time they used it and that ended the, the cannon bit uh, so well please don't put that in there it's just it's uh, just an incidental thing that occurred it, it bringing back these memories of of working with these large groups but the the military the, the, the vets I think really appreciated and do they still do this do they still do the veteran salute no I don't believe they do I, I, I can't recall I still go to games over there but I can't recall lately I haven't seen anything about it um, it, it might be for these guys and gals that have been in these other wars yeah it'd be a a nice thing to do maybe yeah well hopefully uh, they I, I have to be honest I don't know 100% if they're doing it or not so I'll check for you and yeah, get back to you I, I, I really doubt it I think it's one of those things that's changed with the what did you do in the veteran salutes was it just marching music or did you have some special special something that you did well um, yeah um, one time we we got and I've got a picture of it somewhere uh, we got the two high school bands to come in and um, <coughs> we were in the center in a V and with a kind of appropriate you can make out an A and one of the high school bands did a smaller U out here and the other did an S over here in the center we had the, the uh, vets uh, along the track on the east side and so as we played the armed forces songs and we had them you know marines army navy and and so forth and and so as we of course they knew when when they were going to come up but when we got into the navy thing here comes the, the best from the the navy and the, and then it goes into the army here comes the army and just segues one to the other so it's it's an awfully lot of motion and flow uh, into that and it's in and, and, and they're carrying later on we we had all of them carry small flags um, and, and picture wise not only did it give a tribute to the veterans and I'm sure they felt that they you know been recognized again um, I don't know why I get well, I guess the age and uh, but it actually was really a, a good scenario. It, it, it would run about 12 to 14 minutes at, at the halftime. And uh, publicity wise, it got pretty good coverage. The second and the third years now. I don't think they do it anymore. Um, it's a lot of things that we used to do, they don't do anymore. Um, it wouldn't be a bad thing to do. <laughs> but that's. Probably use a little bit usefulness. Um, Maybe not. <laughs> it was. They appreciated it, and, and of course they had meals there. Uh, it, it made a just a really nice day. And it, and them. this happened um, separately from the football games, or as part oh, of no, the football it was, games? It was, it was a just a separate halftime half show. Okay. Of the football game. Mm -hmm. And back in those days, you all won your football games. I should say, we won our football <laughs> games. <laughs> well, if we had some good teams. Coach Murphy was a tremendous coach. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, we had, had good records, good crowds. You know, we didn't have as large a stadium as we have now. Yeah. And, uh, Do you go to the football games now? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And watch the marching band? Yeah. 
So. Oh, he's doing a great job. I mean, just absolutely opposite from me. But what he's doing, he's doing really well. And uh, he's more of a razzmatazz uh, sort of thing. And that was his deal. Now, we, we played, um, is, we were known as really an outstanding marching band. And, and, and I made an awfully lot of money doing clinics and workshops across this country. About, I think it was in about 37 states. Um, so it was, it was good for me. Um, and it, what was, um, where was I going with this? That you made a lot of money with, with marching bands and... Yeah. But you were a traditional Marine Corps style, it, it, John Phillips Traditional Philip Marine Corps style, and, uh, but we had soloists. Um, that were just unreal. The one I think of right now, he's uh, number one a trumpet call in, in Nashville, Mike Haynes. Uh, and uh, we would feature him and have some of the most marvelous arrangements to back him up. And we were still the marching band, but we had phenomenal soloists. And so we, that was our big deal, you know. So. And uh, I still hear Mike every once in a while and I saw him in Nashville I think about six months ago down at the War Memorial not War Memorial but Skimmerhorn and the other one is George Clinton who was just here about two weeks ago George is one of my boys and uh, he's done rather well it's there's a list in here over 110 movie scores that he's written so uh, he's wow. he's okay and you taught him how to do that no 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 I um, he was in the band and he worked for me as a student, you know, he was on scholarship so you had to work. And um, I started him on recording. I had some awfully good recording equipment that uh, we used and uh, it was locked up. No one touched it except me and uh, God, we had $1,100 microphones and a recorder at that time cost nearly $5,000. Um, but I won't tell you how I got it, but <laughs> we had it and it stayed under lock and key. Because <coughs> you drop that mic one time and that's it. Uh, so uh, uh, George learned his recording techniques here and of course now he has his own studio in his backyard. Mm -hmm. uh, or has he invited you out there to see it? Well, he has, but I haven't taken him up on it. I did call him night before last. Uh, he lives in the, the second valley out from Los Angeles in Tarzana. And those valleys uh, were, you know, just all fire. Mm -hmm. So I finally got up enough nerve to call to see if the phone was going to ring. And Billy got on the phone and talked to a wife. And they're okay. It's it's on either side of them, but it's in the yeah. other balance. Yeah. And hopefully, it's not going to wind. Isn't going to change and take over here, Vanessa. But right now, they're they're doing good. Well, you have had, and, and I'm not going to keep you much longer. But um, you've spent pretty much your entire life at MTSU. Oh yeah. So give me the rough dates. First of all, give me the rough dates before I prod you a little more. How long were you there? Um, I was there 33 years. As a, I'm, go, I'm going for as a undergraduate all the way Oh, through. oh, oh. 37. Well, it was 37 years, but then I started a community band here and I started when I was still teaching, but I would come back and have those rehearsals on, I think it was Tuesday evenings that we had rehearsals. Um, but actively involved would be um, 37 years. That's amazing. So. Can you articulate at all what the university has had, what kind of an impact it's had on your life? I mean, I know that that's kind of 
Can you articulate? Can you put into words what it's meant to you? Everything. Had I not entered in this school, I probably would have gone back to the core. Um, and would. Who knows what would have happened? We've, we've had a lot of little skirmishes, you know, since then. In fact, very shortly after that, they were, we had the problem and send the Marines into. So, um, it has been my entire life. Well, adult life. And uh, I really could not think of a scenario that I would have preferred. Do you have any camaraderie, the, the, the faculty, the students, um, and the modest success? Uh, More than modest, you just had something named well, after you. Well, maybe I understated that. <laughs> <laughs> now, when you look at this, I don't know. Um, You're allowed that, to brag. Well, I, I just don't, but I, I sure can't put those things in, in a drawer, you know, because uh, they were all a major part of my life. And, uh, so, uh, but that was my first boat over there. I just happened to see it on the wall, that little 32-foot um, Chris Craft. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, that was... Center Hill? No, I kept it uh, down on the... Uh, at uh, Marina at uh, Hendersonville, Anchor High Marina. And then I finally moved up to Cedar, Cedar Creek Yacht Club in Mount Julia. But that, that was the first of, I think, five boats. That is, there, is there one event, and, and you may not be able to do this, but is there one event at your time at MTSU, whether as an undergraduate or a graduate, that just sort of is the first thing you think of when you think of your time at... If you close your eyes and you open them, what's the first it thing? It has to be Neil and Margaret Wright. They were probably the greatest influence in my life. And I had so much admiration in, in all of their talent that... Uh, and they were very understanding to veterans and uh, would give you a little extra help when you'd go and say, well, I just don't understand this. And, uh, but see, they were veterans and, and we had the camaraderie, not only as instructor and student, but as equals from the standpoint of military and some, this sort of thing. Mm -hmm. a, you know, it had to, it would have to be then with Neil and Margaret, and of course without Neil and Margaret I would have never met Billy, so... I so you owe them a lot. Oh yeah. Do you stay in touch with their family? Beg your pardon? Do you stay in touch with their family? Um, uh, no, they, uh, Neil Jr. has a... I used to stay in touch with, <coughs> with him, but he has a farm, horse farm, um, out on Franklin Road somewhere, and he's big time in the jumpers, and it's going, mm -hmm. uh, no, I just don't, and of course, they lived only about, about five houses down. Um, and and then, what about your own kids? Did they go to school here? Yeah. And how many kids did you have? Um, I had three. Two of them went to school here, and my, my oldest son was, was was killed in, in I'm sorry. a car accident out in, in Texas, but he, he went into the military. Um, um, rather than coming to school, and so. Um, but Jeff, um, my youngest, he went to school here, and he's doing well in Atlanta. My daughter, who lives next door, she's a teacher here in Rutherford County. So um, 
she got her degrees here. Ocean Beauty got her degrees here. Mm -hmm. It's and I still go back to campus, not as often as I used to, but uh, <clears throat> I go to football games and, and some basketball games, but as far as the music department, uh, this year, well, I, I'm recuperating from a really serious operation, and so I just haven't been at much in the last couple of years. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, but I'm getting better. Do they give you a special place to sit at the football games? Oh no, but we're going to have to change our seating. It's, it's up on, gosh, I think, 21st row. It's mm -hmm. <laughs> way up there. Yeah, I'm going to start using the elevator one. <laughs> we, we were over, um, sometimes we, we stay, we leave in the middle of the third quarter or something, you know, because you say, oh, well, they got this thing knocked, you know. Mm -hmm. and, but, um, and we, we still enjoy going back on campus and, and the play productions and concerts. We go to an awful lot of the concerts that they give. Let me ask you one last question. Okay.